Hello, everybody. This is uh, Jeremy Johnson with Flyer. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining another one of our produced webcasts. Today, we are here to discuss Allagash Property Investment Partners, private equity real estate investment management company, and the launch of their new working class housing opportunity fund. The fund, the second pair fund from the Allagash team, is designed to capitalize on the wealth of opportunities created by the extreme shortage in the supply of rental housing that is affordable for working class communities across the US. Tony Barkin, the founder and CEO of Allagash Property Investment Partners, is here today to present this uniquely compelling investment opportunity. Take it away, Tony. Hi, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and thank uh, to everybody who is attending. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to get through this in short order and uh, I probably uh, won't get to questions until the end, uh, just because this format uh, makes it a little bit difficult to flip back and forth uh, between the questions and, uh, and the presentation. Um, but if you do have questions, definitely put them into either the chat or the Q&A, uh, and I will get to them at the end. I expect that we'll probably uh, the presentation should be really only 30, 35 minutes, um, uh, depending on how quickly I speak, maybe less. Um, when you're alone, uh, maybe it tends to go a little faster. Uh, and uh, so uh, again, I thank you all for attending. Um, we've got your basic you know, business before the business and the standard uh, disclaimers. Um, in terms of investors uh, for the fund, uh, the fund uh, is eligible for accredited investors or qualified purchasers. Um, we do have a methodology for non-U.S. investors to invest through an offshore insurance annuity structure. Um, and if anybody was invited to this uh, in an unsolicited way, completely unsolicited way, then we will need to do a 60-day waiting period um, before we can go into contact and talk about the fund. Um, that being said, that shouldn't uh, be a stressful issue uh, because we're looking at doing first closes sometime in Q1, um, and so that will not put people behind the eight ball. Um, with all of that now behind us, let's, let's jump into uh, the fund itself, what we're doing, uh, who we are uh, as a group and why we think this is a, a particularly compelling opportunity, um, both generally and right now um, for investors. Uh, so the Allagash Working Class Housing Opportunity Fund is a private equity real estate fund uh, in a pretty reasonably standard format with a few bells and whistles uh, that we hope will, will add value for investors. Um, we are uh, the management company for that fund. Uh, we, the three partners in, in our company have uh, significant experience together over a hundred years of experience. Um, we as a company are completely focused on working class housing um, and we are designed to reduce fees for investors. And I'll go through details on this uh, on all of this uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, our fund focuses on the working class housing sector, which we think again is particularly compelling because it combines the ability to have a, a diverse and scalable portfolio in an area where there's an extreme shortage in supply, yet advantageous pricing, which is a unique combination. Um, and the sector also historically benefited from excellent performance during the great financial crisis and so far during the COVID pandemic. Um, some things that we're probably not gonna go through that are just pretty straightforward is that working class housing is an underrepresented low volatility asset class for many portfolios. Um, and we'll talk about the size of the marketplace, which is really significant um, and yet very few people have allocations to it. And we do distinguish between working class housing and workforce housing. And I'll talk about some of those distinctions as well as we go through the presentation. 
Um, and finally, uh, right now, given where we are in the macroeconomic cycle, the fact that, that housing properties are an inflation hedging real asset that is also income generating, I think is, is a particularly compelling general allocation idea right now. Um, in terms of the, the headline for the fund, uh, our target net IRR is 18%. Um, we, uh, I'll talk about, uh, about our current fund in a second, the first fund. Um, and, and we also distinguish ourselves by proactively working with the communities, uh, which we think both definitely benefits the communities, but also actively reduces the risk um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the portfolio, uh, as well as, in fact, also uh, pushing up the potential uh, for even higher IRRs. So uh, with all that said, let me talk about who we are. Uh, as I said, uh, the three partners in, uh, in Allagash have over 100 years of experience um, with major companies. We have all uh, been on both work for large institutional businesses as well as been entrepreneurial. Uh, my other two partners, Peter Zellius and Mark Hall, have worked together previously uh, at GE Real Estate. I've worked with both of them over the course of over 10 years in doing various uh, transactions in the marketplace. Um, so we've known each other for quite a while. As well, we are now over a year into our first fund, uh, which is specifically uh, focused on the value add strategy uh, within properties or for properties that are within the Mid-Atlantic Opportunity Zone marketplace. And so it's, it's a, it's a, it is a more focused uh, product. Um, it's also been an Opportunity Zone fund, which is uh, caught, you know, also causes it to be more focused um, and somewhat more complex uh, than a standard private equity real estate fund. Um, but in terms of us being a new company, we are a relatively new company, but we've also got the experience now of working together for well over a year on this other fund, which we do believe is heading towards returns that are going to be above those that we initially projected, uh, which were initially uh, 14, we've, we've, we've raised them so far to 16, but we think we're going to outperform that as well. Um, we've got experience in this particular strategy, um, all of us uh, with respect to working class housing. I'm not going to read that to you. Um, for anybody who'd like this presentation, I guess it's a good chance to say that we're, we're happy to send it to you. And in the back of the presentation, again, we won't go through it in today's uh, uh, presentation, but, but there are full partner bios. Um, in terms of the way we're designed, we think that our focus on the working class housing sector is somewhat unique um, because it is, it is focused on all of the aspects of that sector without, uh, with, with some, some, I guess, the added bells and whistles being that in our private equity real estate funds, we serve both as the fund manager as well as the property sponsor. So that serves to reduce fees for investors because we are not subjecting investors to third party sponsors who are charging their own promote structure plus their own investment management or property management over and above what is the official property management. Um, as well as some of the other transaction oriented fees that get associated with the uh, multi-tiered structure. So while this is a private equity real estate fund, it is not effectively a fund of properties where we go out to a set of sponsors. Um, we keep these funds within a certain level of size because we want to be able to both choose the property to then actually work the property and own the property ourselves, um, rather than simply being a distributor of capital 
uh, to a set of sponsors uh, in various areas. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's somewhat unique. Uh, it, it definitely serves in terms of cost control. Um, and as I said, and we can talk, about, I'll go through it later when we talk about the end, uh, the specifics of the fund, um, I'll go through those specific costs. Uh, but I think that that design uh, it, it should be, uh, and I hope you find it very investor friendly. Um, the, I talked about the idea that this is working class housing, which we differentiate from workforce housing. Uh, part of that is that, that workforce housing is an incredibly imprecise term. Uh, it's become somewhat of a controversial term because it really focuses on everything from affordable housing, low income housing, um, subsidized housing, all the way up through effectively major market uh, infill that is class B plus, A minus type housing. Um, and as a result of that imprecision, it, it obviously offers people a lot of flexibility in terms of what they're going to be investing in. But the flip side of the positive of flexibility is that it also winds up, we think, focusing people very much uh, into the major markets and into the classic investments that are really just overlapping with a lot of the other investment focus that people already have. So we choose to look at this in terms of working class housing um, and to think about it in a much more precise way uh, without necessarily taking out uh, a significant amount of opportunity. Um, the working class is the largest least supported economic tier in the US. And if you look at this pie chart, you'll see that right now it represents almost half of the US population, which shouldn't be a surprise. It, it, it's defined as people making between 60 and 120% of area med median income, um, which winds up being uh, widely writ between 40 and $100,000 of household income, um, generally described for a, a four person family. And so uh, the, other, the other groups, uh, obviously the unemployed, the impoverished and the working poor, which are below in terms of prosperity, the working class um, are really generally tend more towards the subsidized housing world um, as opposed to the market rate housing. Um, while the working savers, the affluent and the independently wealthy group, which are uh, more affluent uh, or more prosperous, uh, tend to focus on that B plus A minus A housing. Um, and actually, if you combine all of the groups that are less prosperous, which is about 28%, currently, um, and you were to combine all of the groups that were more prosperous, which is less than 20%, those combinations, in fact, are smaller than the working class in this country. And so as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of housing that's focused on the working class community. Um, the, the next important thing to understand about this community is that the working class need to be renters. They simply cannot put together the equity requirement for purchase of housing. Um, they just don't have, even at the four family median income uh, across the US of $76,000, if you look at effectively the income statement on the right, uh, of uh, the, and the income and expense statement of that family, you see that they've got about $1,000 of disposable income. Uh, and that is an annual number. That's not a monthly number. It's not certainly not a weekly number, um, or for some people, a daily number. Uh, that is, that's an annual number um, when you break it down. And as a result of that, you've got a situation where 
it will effectively take a lifetime for somebody to put to, for, for, a, for a four person family uh, at the median income level to put together the nest egg that's required to be the down payment against the average housing purchase price, um, which is on the left-hand side of this page, um, where you see again that that's $58,000 on average. Um, and as a result, this group of people, this 44% of the American population, by and large, need to be renters. Um, you know, there's obviously going to be exceptions. People have inherited their homes from their parents who bought them previously during a, a different time when there was a different paradigm uh, for purchase and, and for income and income distribution in the country. Um, what is interesting is it isn't because they can't afford to maintain their home. The cost of rent, the median cost of rent, is about equivalent to the median cost of home ownership. Um, which is about it, which is about eighteen thousand dollars. In fact, the average, or that's an annual number. In fact, the the average U.S. renter right now can afford about eighteen thousand, eighteen hundred dollars a month in rent, um, with a rent range that's considered affordable. Uh, if you look at that that forty thousand to hundred thousand dollars of about seven hundred and fifty to twenty five hundred dollars a month for a two bedroom unit. Um, with all that being said, what's, you know, this is just descriptive. I think it's important to, to think about the opportunity and the opportunity is with respect to the affordability gap. Um, and that affordability gap is defined as uh, households that are required to pay more than 30% of their gross earnings for housing. Um, and here we really talk about, about that opportunity. And I think that's the, you know, that can be defined as the supply demand shortage, um, which is a fairly intractable shortage, which we'll describe in a second, um, because the number of households paying rent uh, that's greater than 30% of their gross income is over 6 million households. Um, and in fact, that, that's the affordability gap. However, of that 6 plus million households, over a million households are paying rent that's 50, that's greater than 50% of their gross income. And that's defined as housing poverty. Um, you know, we, we, we've got a situation, if you look below, where that number of, of units, if you were to use all of the construction capacity for housing in the US right now, both single family and multifamily, and you were to attempt to fill that gap by building units, it would take over five years to build units that were affordable for that community. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that these people are all homeless, that's not the case. They're just paying too much. So there is, there are existing properties, they just aren't there at an affordable level. Um, in fact, right now, there's two units of affordable, housing for working class population or working class members uh, are being lost to age and neglect for every new unit that's coming online. So what you've got in fact, is not only a six plus million dollar, I mean, six plus million unit shortage, but a growing shortage. Um, and as we take that into account that it's growing, um, it would take in fact, eight years of dedicated building to fill that up. Now, why are there properties that exist that are too expensive? Well, we, we know the answer to that. They're obviously higher quality. They're in expensive areas. And so people are not making as much money, but they are forced to, to pay that kind of rent. The other issue is that there simply isn't a profitable paradigm for development of rental housing that is affordable to people making this kind of income. Um, and, and that's a significant issue. And that's really the cause of this. So it, it isn't so much that, uh, that you've got a situation that there isn't housing available. It's simply that there isn't the ability to fill housing 
from a ground up development standpoint that's profitable for developers if they're going to be charging rents that are also affordable to this working class community uh, across the country. There are obviously developments, and this is where workforce housing and that term tends to be a more widespread. There are going to be idiosyncratic opportunities to buy land cheap, to do development inexpensively, to get particularly good financing that can become affordable. So idiosyncratically, there have been opportunities and investors will say, well, I've done a workforce project, but it isn't scalable. Um, and it's caused because uh, of the age of the, the workforce housing or the working class housing uh, stock in this country, which now averages an early 80s build and hasn't been particularly well kept up because of age and neglect and uh, the attrition from the housing stock what we've seen is this continued growth and continuing growth of the shortage. So one of the reasons, you know, we get back to, to talking about why we focus on this. Uh, my partners and I have all spent years, as you can imagine, with each over 30 years uh, in the marketplace um, and, and with expertise that is particular to this, but also is wider spread with respect to both commercial real estate as well as other pro financial products in the marketplace. And with respect to my history, to a lot of uh, more liquid sectors in the marketplace. Uh, and, and my history of having worked both at hedge funds and doing private equity transactions in real estate. In terms of the hedge fund side, in terms of other types of opportunities, it, the, the, the investor, or going back to me particularly, when I was trading liquid markets, was in a situation where you were always looking for the market imbalance that would allow you to put on a profitable trade. It was a continuous process, and it was an arduous process. You wake up every morning and you need to find something new that's going to be uh, an opportunity that's based upon some imbalance in the marketplace that causes pricing to be imbalanced. The great part about this sector is that this imbalance is effectively intractable. This is not something where we have to wake up and need a new idea tomorrow. This 6 million households across the country need the opportunity to get housing at an affordable price. And if you can provide it, they will live in it. And so that opportunity and the fact that that's not going away for years and years, because we're not going to take, certainly we don't have a paradigm right now for building. Um, we, there, there's not a lot of people focused on this, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and so the opportunity is a tremendous opportunity. And you know what we've described till now from a social standpoint can be considered a crisis. From an investment standpoint, it's a significant opportunity. And it's nationwide. The other thing that's that's worth pointing out here is this is not this is not some sort of unicorn event where there's just certain sectors, there's certain areas that are problematic. This is a nationwide event, um, and as a result of that, it provides the opportunity to create a diversified portfolio of properties focused, obviously, on a particular sector but diversified from a geographic and marketplace standpoint. Um, and it also provides the opportunity to do this scalably. And again, I'll go back to the way in which we're structured, which is that historically, the way so much workforce housing has been invested into is at the property level, because the economics of it are fairly tight. And when you build in the multiple layers of a scalable private equity real estate fund over and above focusing on working class rental housing or workforce housing, it eliminates so much of the economics of the transaction that you wind up in a situation where you can't do it. Our structure allows for an economic creation. And again, I'll show you in a second how in fact the economics are less limited, but so many, so much of the economics and workforce housing has been focused on ground up development. 
um, which is not an economic paradigm unless you'd like to take the risk of development in order to make returns of the treasury market, um, you know, by and large, at least on a scalable basis. Uh, we've created the opportunity for investors to create a scalable, diversified portfolio uh, in this sector that does focus uh, on the areas opportunistically where there is the, the best returns. So that's, I think, broadly writ, you know, kind of the situation and the economic situation. And so, you know, I want to get into really, I think the, the, the initial discussion has to be, if this is such a good opportunity, why has capital not been focused on it? And I think we need to answer that question before we talk about uh, what we're going to do in this and, and what, the, what we're going to do and how we manage it. I do want to focus on why the capital hasn't come there. Um, and, you know, it's really one thing we know, and it's absolute, is that investment capital has primarily been focused on, you know, what I'll call uh, shiny new properties in primary cities. Um, that's the feeling has been that that the risk of investing outside of that primary focus is too great that it's not easy enough or it's not uh, there's there's not a significant opportunity to scale for institutional investors um, and as a result that's why the capital has been focused and and you know I include here some actual quotes of things that we've heard um, from some institutional investors um, in various formats um, and they're all true there's nothing here that I would argue with from a statement. There is nothing sexy about this is, by the way, this actually is uh, our pictures of a particular property that is in uh, our initial fund. Um, it's in Newport News, Virginia. Um, there is nothing sexy about it. Uh, pictures tend not to be particularly exciting to investors. Uh, the neighborhood isn't exciting. Um, and I, my favorite, which is, I wouldn't enjoy walking my dog around here. You'll excuse the laugh. Um, an actual, uh, you know, quote about this. That actually wasn't about this property or about our first fund, but it, it is a quote that is actually from somebody looking at working class housing um, as an investment. And, uh, you know, all of those quotes I said are, are absolutely true and accurate. It's, it's not sexy. It's not necessarily exciting, um, except for the returns. Um, and that's, I think, what is exciting is that the potential, it's really the returns as well as the low level of risk that these properties actually present. I think that's what's exciting. Uh, and as such, none of these uh, comments are the way in which we make or choose to make our investments. You know, we follow a very simple investment process. We buy opportunistically, we add value and develop intelligently, we manage efficiently, and we sell strategically. Um, and there's a lot of components to each of those, uh, as well as obviously to the whole process. But we think that when you look at that process, in which we think that process, by the way, defines the right way to make money in the commercial real estate marketplace generally, we think when you take that structure, that, that process, and you apply it to the various aspects of the commercial marketplace, commercial real estate marketplace, what you see is that this sector offers the best both outright return as well as risk return profile. Um, and that's the way we've chosen to create both our company as well as uh, the fund offering um, that we've got. So, you know, with that in mind, let's talk about what it is that we plan on doing, you know, and let's put a little flesh to this. Um, you know, this is probably the page that's simplest with the, the least bells and whistles and things to make it visually interesting. Um, and I hope, honestly, the most straightforward. Um, again, opportunistic purchasing we're considering location, uh, the strategy for the property, as well as community engagement. And I will flesh out all of those 
um, you know, for the value add strategy and actually really also for the adaptive reuse strategy, which are the two main strategies in this fund. Because as I mentioned before, there is not a great, while idiosyncratically development can be done, there's not a great profitable paradigm for development. So when you look at this, you the, really the two most profitable strategies are value add and adaptive reuse. And in both of those strategies, when we talk about opportunistic purchasing, we're looking at uh, at least 65 to 75% discount uh, for the stabilized property, for the cost of the stabilized property uh, relative to the cost of ground up development. Um, and that's important because that's what allows us to then offer those properties at an affordable level for the existing working class communities, which means that we don't need to make the properties or the strategy for the properties uh, and the projects that we work on perspective. We don't need to think that we need gentrification, that we need a new group of affluent community members to move into our communities. We're not building with that. We can still generate excellent returns with a much more stable process of working with that community um, and, and with the members of that community. And part of it is also the wide range of rents in it. So what we focus on in that purchase process is looking at the properties that are at the bottom decile or, or maybe widely writ the bottom quartile of rents in that local marketplace. And if we can buy that, those at a very low cost of entry and then do a full renovation uh, or, or an adaptive reuse to a property at an even lower cost of entry. Um, and, then, uh, and then bring that back. The rents won't be those bottom decile rents, but we can just bring them back to median second quartile rents serving the existing community. Um, and, we can, and, and we can provide a service to the community which is why community engagement is so important. And I'm gonna talk about that specifically uh, in a second and why that we think that's uh, a dramatic uh, differentiation. Um, in terms of intelligent value add and development, I've talked a little bit about that. Um, the process includes entitlement, it, it includes construction and finance. Um, and there we're obviously looking at processes. Entitlement is really a timing process and a cost process. Um, construction also is timing and cost, but it's also about understanding the local marketplace and making sure that you're constructing uh, to the appropriate level uh, of value add um, for that marketplace. And finally, finance in terms of op optimizing uh, the structure. Uh, efficient management is very straightforward. Uh, it's income and expense management, as well as positioning the properties appropriately. Um, and finally, strategic sale, uh, which is timing and process, and we'll talk more about that as well. Um, but the process here is very important. We think when you take this process for adding value, for creating value and creating returns for investors, that what you'll find is that this shortage of, of housing and the capacity to buy properties at extremely low levels that exist in these communities is what creates and begins to create the value um, for the entire process and for the, for the fund as a whole. Um, you know, within the purchase process, I talked about it as uh, the location being the most important, certainly can't go through any real estate fund or, or real estate description without talking about uh, location, location, location. Um, we understand that's, it's, it's almost the first question that people ask, where do you focus? Um, and so, uh, you know, we are focused specifically, again, probably not surprisingly, on the smile, uh, which we actually, we don't take it all the way up through the Northeast, because as you can see, the, the, the Northeastern density uh, is what contributes as well as the focus of capital on that area. That's what contributes to the significant cost uh, associated with properties in that area. So we tend to really start kind of in the mid-Atlantic states 
then swing down through the southern states and, and head back up. But within, you know, all the way up the West Coast, although, again, we, we tend not to be in the larger cities in, in California either. Um, we're looking generally, uh, well, let's, you know, within that geographic region, the other thing we're looking at is really what could be called the peri-urban communities. Um, and and the, that generalized graph on the top right, which shows obviously the urban core, which is the central business districts of these uh, metropolitan areas, um, is then surrounded by a mix of suburban communities and peri-urban communities. And finally, as you get further away, the rural areas. Um, and the distinction between suburban and peri-urban is that the suburban communities are associated with a level of affluence that is not evident in the peri-urban communities. The peri-urban communities are just what we'll call in a good old fashioned way, working class towns. They're, they're towns that uh, the people are, are working and making average median income for the area. It's not about a level of affluence that we associate with, with suburban area. Um, in terms of our then taking that general approach and making it specific, uh, we look at uh, and, we, and we, we get a lot of statistics that, that we then put into uh, our proprietary process to focus our efforts onto specific metropolitan areas. So it's really a top-down meets bottom-up approach. The top-down part of that is this geographic targeting process where we look for uh, metropolitan areas generally considered secondary metropolitan areas with populations of 250,000 to two and a half million people, which uh, if you consider that the U.S. has about 380 metropolitan areas statistically across the country, in of those areas, that represents pretty much kind of area uh, from a uh, population ranking standpoint between 250,000 and two, uh, I'm sorry, between number 20 and number uh, 180. So it takes you to about halfway, but it excludes, uh, you know, generally about, a, about half of the areas, although that's obviously not half the population because some of those are, are, are not at all uh, heavily populated. Um, the, uh, uh, what we look for is we look for uh, growing economy, growing demographics uh, generally. That's our, that's our, then we look at a, a set of measures that allow us to understand uh, the community. Then within that, we're looking, obviously the, the a metropolitan area is actually many, many, uh, it's a city or a set of cities uh, grouped together um, with many towns and, and, and even smaller cities uh, that are together with that. And so we're then looking for the peri-urban communities with solid working class populations that also have identifiable employment growth for that community. Um, and so that's the way we start to do the top down. The bottom up piece obviously then becomes the property itself. Um, and with respect to the property, we're looking really at a set of, uh, of, of strategies that we can employ opportunistically. Again, it's an opportunity fund. Primarily, and you see by the pie chart, we're gonna be doing value add. Um, we think that that is uh, incredibly stable. There's a huge uh, population um, of, of properties. Uh, the, to, 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 to put uh, a number on it right now, the commercial real estate market in the United States is about a $20 trillion market. Um, of that, about $2 trillion represents workforce rental housing uh, across the country. Again, not surprising given that that's housing, uh, you know, the rental housing for 44% of the population. Um, and so the ability, that, given the fact that the owners of those properties tend to be second and third generation owners. They tend to not be traditional real estate uh, managers and owners. And as a result, uh, and they also haven't been shown any significant capital for purchase. 
in 20 to 40 years or longer, um, which is not surprising given the fact that this is not sexy, this is not where capital is focused. Um, as a result, that's why the purchase prices can be so low uh, on a per unit basis. Um, and I can talk about, uh, you know, I, I will I probably uh, independently for people that are interested, um, we we'll talk about what cap rate means because in general for these properties, because they're being managed so inefficiently, this structure of the purchase is not necessarily based upon the traditional metric of value being cap rate, um, but rather more about a, a price per unit because very often we'll see properties that have expense ratios in the 60s and 70s um, where a, a professionally managed property should have an expense ratio in the 30s and 40s. As a result, the profitability of the property is so low, there's so much deferred maintenance that you really can't, it's, it's not efficient to look at these from an opportunistic standpoint on a purely cap uh, basis. Uh, it really has to be about the property cost on a per unit basis after uh, all of the renovation is done on a stabilized basis. And what we can see then is that we're really able to create opportunities at the high single digits, uh, eight to 10% range, um, uh, which obviously offers significant profitability uh, for investors. Um, so the value add strategy is the main piece of this. Adapted reuse is the second, especially today. And this is really uh, as large a part of this um, for two reasons. One of which is the we're not targeting a $5 billion fund. I think that would be harder to have adaptive reuse be as large a piece of this uh, if we were targeting that kind of mega fund. Um, I mean, obviously we're, we're a newer company, so it would be egregious for us to think about something like that anyway. But uh, in fact, because we're looking at 75 to 150 is kind of a target range and you know, maybe up to 500 if, um, if, if investors become enthusiastic about what we're doing um, and we get more institutional investors who have larger allocations, um, certainly we can take it up to that level. Um, the adaptive reuse piece we think is, is, has an even higher potential net IRR um, and it also is offered at, at a, a very, very compelling price for these properties um, because many of these properties are dark. So there's, there's the structural uh, reason that we can have this large, but it's also right now, quite honestly, this is reactive to the pandemic, which is that we're seeing a significant number of opportunities, uh, both with respect to hotels, um, as well as with respect to general properties that are owned in dark, uh, that are owned by local municipalities and are dark. And for those municipalities who are having issues with respect to their budgets and their funding, they're now looking to sell the assets that have, that have been kind of sitting there that they have under control. And so as a result, we're seeing a significantly, uh, significant uptick in the number of opportunities. Um, so we've got that as, as a larger piece of this. And I think that'll continue for the next couple of years, at least, certainly for the investment uh, timeframe for the fund. Uh, development we put in is 10%. That will be purely opportunistic. As I've said, there are some opportunities to do development um, and they show up idiosyncratically. Um, we don't wanna completely eliminate them, um, but we don't expect that to be a large portion of the portfolio. Um, and as well, we've got uh, some potential to do co-GP investing. Really there, uh, our view is that we don't have a monopoly on all of the really good ideas. There are in, you know, sponsors that we like who are occasionally looking for co-GP capital. Um, uniquely, I think, for our structure and this fund, uh, to the extent that the fund provides co-GP capital to sponsors that are, that, to sponsors where we're not the sponsor, um, and there is a carried interest that is provided, that carried interest will go 100% into the fund uh, as fund revenue. So, and, and this does offer the opportunity for the fund to invest into a project with no added cost, but in fact, extra revenue, because the co-GP capital is not subject 
to the management costs and the other costs associated with being an LP investor in a particular project. And as a result, you, there's no added fees. And uh, if there is going to be uh, carried interest, that will accrue 100% to the fund. So we, we like the opportunity potentially to do that. We have seen some projects that we do like, um, and, uh, and we wanna make sure that the, the fund can be as opportunistic as possible, just because we're combining the sponsor and the fund management process together, we don't want the fund to miss out on opportunities that we think are particularly compelling. Um, and again, as you can see, the range of projected IRRs uh, on these, um, you'll see that we would only do that when we think we can generate particularly compelling IRRs. And in fact, um, I think I'm probably being conservative on these. I think we can you know, very often, uh, the co-GP investment can, can provide even higher IRRs. But uh, again, it'll be a smaller piece of the portfolio. So that's really our structure, you know, in terms of identifying areas to be in uh, geographically, and then from the bottom up, looking at these projects and determining which of them are going to provide us uh, within those particular locations, uh, the right types of returns with the right type of risk. Um, and, and talking about risk is the right way for us to get into uh, discussion of community engagement. And here, I think this is an area that is dramatically underemphasized um, by the investment community. And, you know, we've talked here, and, and I'm not going to read you all of this, um, but, you know, we understand that, that very often the community can look at what we're doing and think that it really fits within uh, the impact investing goals and guidelines um, that the communities are hoping for. Where investors tend to get into trouble is when they don't engage with the community. And this conversation was somewhat more difficult, uh, or this part of the presentation was more difficult to describe until we had such a public uh, event as, uh, as, as we had most recently with Amazon in Queens. Uh, in New York City, where they went into the community and they basically, you know, didn't engage with the community. Um, I think that what they were planning on doing would have been beneficial to the community, but they, uh, but they, they never went and engaged. And as a result, the community and certain members of the community were able to pick on certain aspects of their project and eventually create an environment that was entirely hostile to the project. That's the downside. The downside uh, is if you don't engage with the community, communities, and it doesn't, yes, it, it, it can be focused more on lower income communities, but the risk exists equally in middle income communities and working class communities. And it also exists in various ways in communities of high income. And so I think that it's incredibly important to engage with the community, especially for these projects where the community has so much capacity to provide additional financing for a project at incredibly low prices at 1% at, at or in some cases effectively cost free. Um, they also have the ability to support the local area if, if you know, these we're still we're not talking about low income communities, we're really talking about middle income communities for this portfolio. But nonetheless, middle income communities can be additionally developed around projects if you can go in and work with the community, and that will absolutely add to the potential returns. So, you're both decreasing the risk of the project as well as adding uh, to the potential returns of the project by engaging with the communities. And that is absolutely part of our process. As well, for impact investors, we believe that obviously impact investors have focused primarily on, uh, on the lowest income communities. But as I said in that graph, we talked about who the working class population are. 
they are the largest and least supported community. And as a result, that's why this housing crisis has come to exist because nobody is out there trying to create, there's actually a much more profitable paradigm for development of subsidized housing than there is for working class housing, which is ironic given the fact that working class housing are obviously paying higher rents. And yet there is a, there, there is, uh, a, a lack of a profitable development paradigm. Um, so we we'll talked about the, the entry strategy. I want to talk a little bit about the exit strategy for the portfolio. Um, again, I think that this is, uh, uh, offers a range of choices because we are not just looking at a particular property, but rather uh, looking at a portfolio of properties. And with the goal of managing those properties, because again, this is, yes, it's an opportunity fund and it's a, it's a private equity real estate fund, it's an opportunity fund, but it is so tightly focused that we think that that offers some significant upside for us to either uh, at, the, at the end of this portfolio, uh, do a, uh, an UPRI uh, IPO with the properties, which obviously would have significant upside over and above our base case projected returns. Um, in the base case, we're looking at an institutional portfolio sale, which we think offers uh, a very compelling uh, opportunity to exit the, the, the portfolio. And in the contingency case would be individual property sales. This will not be so many properties that it would take years and years to get rid of. That's again, we're looking at, even, even if we were to go to the absolute upside in terms of the size of the fund, um, we can absolutely, uh, and you'll excuse the typo that I now see in the word contingency, um, we, we absolutely can sell the property in a reason and sell the properties in a reasonable period of time um, for the fund. And so that really takes us kind of, you know, from the sector through the fund, uh, you know, in conclusion, what are our competitive advantages? Um, you know, why, why us, why this fund, why now? Um, I think at the top line, you know, one is the, the true focus on working class housing on the ability to buy assets that are particularly cheap for which there is very little competition um, and for which there is a huge supply of assets. Um, and that's despite this group being one of the best performing sectors, if not potentially the best performing sector during the financial crisis um, and, and a sector that's performing particularly well on a comparative basis right now. Um, you know, for, for, for us, uh, in terms of Allagash and this fund, um, we have a very clear and direct vision. We've got an extensive sourcing network, which is why we can access properties at extremely low basis. Um, we've got an established process that we've used in a previous fund, um, as well as that we've used in our previous, you know, again, over 100 years of, uh, of experience. Um, and we really focus on risk management, on making sure that we are engaged with our communities, that we are uh, appropriately uh, thinking about the way in which the property fits into that community to optimize both the returns and minimize the risk, uh, or both optimize the returns and minimize the risk. Um, you know, finally, at the, at the baseline is the way in which we've created the fund and, and ourselves to provide an opportunity for investors to get a diversified fund in this sector um, that doesn't cost more money. Um, and I think that that really, you know, all together sums up why we think this is a particularly good opportunity and why uh, we believe that the fund and, and, and our management uh, have significant uh, advantages over other, uh, you know, to the extent you see them, other opportunities in the sector. Um, general information uh, here in terms of our fees. Um, you know, again, you'll see that we don't, there's not a lot of transaction fees here. Um, we've, we, we've kept our fee uh, at, at a low level. We've also created the, the management charge um, as a fee initially, uh, and then as a share of income. And I can, I'm happy to talk about that at some point in the future. Um, with, with investors, uh, I don't want to take up more time. We've, we've already taken up most of the hour. Um, 
we've uh, we've kept our I think the incentive fees at a low level. The the carried interest. There are no catch ups. Uh, hundred percent of uh, income, net income goes to investors during the investment period um, until investors have made a full 7% IRR. So we're not taking a share of income um, as part of carried interest. It's a true back-ended incentive fee. Um, what else can I say here? There really isn't. We've, we're obviously working with, in terms of administrator, uh, custodians, auditors, and counsel, uh, people that are top in our industry and our expected first close is Q1 of 2021. Um, so that takes me through uh, the presentation. Uh, I apologize for having taken more time uh, uh, than, than I would have uh, hoped because I would have liked to have left uh, more time for questions. I see that there are great, a lot of questions. Um, uh, and I'm in no particular order. Uh, uh, let's see, what is the average base rent for a working class community in your portfolio? That's excellent. Um, as I said, the range tends to be the fully wide range. The, interestingly enough, uh, and, I, and I don't mean to assume things about the people that are attending this, but my assumption is that, um, that most people's experience directly is with B plus, A minus, and A uh, communities. And in those communities, interestingly enough, the pricing is extremely well developed um, for the community. So that while the average rent for a community might be $5,000 a month, um, you know, for let's say a two bedroom apartment, a uh, two bedroom apartment in New York City, at four to five thousand dollars a month, it's really not four to five thousand. It's really a very tight range. Where if you're getting something at forty six hundred, you're getting a good price. But if you're at five thousand, you're closer to the top end of the market. Maybe not ultra luxury, but it's a very tight band within that kind of five thousand dollar average pricing, less than ten percent. In these communities, the average price tends to be kind of $1,500 uh, with some communities being as high as say 2,500 and some communities being as low as say 1,000 um, or even 900. Um, but let's use 1,500 as the average price. The range in that community from bottom decile to top decile, instead of being 10% around 1,500 is likely to be bottom decile at 700, maybe even 600 and top decile at 20. 400, 2,500, 2,600. So you're talking about a range now that isn't less than 10%. It's actually equal to almost 100%. So you've got this tremendous capacity uh, if you're buying stuff in the bottom decile to raise rents uh, to, uh, to, to the second quartile and really add value to the economics of the property. Um, and that's why this works. So, so I'd say the answer to that question is 1500. Um, and obviously that's, you know, I, I, the, the added commentary is about why that's important. Um, we will make the deck available. That was another set of questions. Um, the, uh, uh, how the financing structure works, um, when we use, uh, VA, um, we do have, we, we, we use both uh, public and private lenders. Um, we, we will use um, uh, both uh, FHA uh, as well as occasionally the agencies and uh, as well as private lenders. So we do use a range of lenders. The structure for each property is meant to optimize the returns on that property. Um, we have also on the development side uh, developed uh, an ability to work with veterans and veteran lenders to actually do uh, townhome developments um, with an extremely efficient capital structure, um, which uh, somebody's asked about, uh, may have heard me mention it before, although I didn't mention it during this presentation, uh, I am happy to, to, to jump on and talk specifically about that um, with anybody um, and why we think that's one of the reasons we wanted to have some development as part of this, not only because idiosyncratically it's possible to be done, but also 
because uh, we do have a particular paradigm that allows us to do it um, selectively, but extremely uh, economically. Um, somebody's so, asking about- So Tony, yeah. um, we're gonna let people who wanna jump off, jump off just to be respectful of their time. But people who want to stay on and ask you questions, they uh, feel free to do so. Yeah, I will. I, well, you know what? I will. I'll, let me answer two more, uh, two more questions, and then uh, we're talking about. Uh, well, we'll. I guess we'll just. I'll try and address the rest of the questions um, in written form uh, today. Uh, one was uh, location. Can you give us a couple of locations? Um, this came through the chat uh, that you that you particularly like. Um, and I'm going to start by answering that in terms of locations you're not likely to see in the fund. You're not likely to see uh, New York, LA, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, Boston um, in the fund. We generally find uh, those are highly competitive uh, areas that are simply too expensive. Um, and there's also not enough land around them uh, to provide additional lower cost opportunities. I think I would contrast that then with say uh, a Dallas where there is still opportunity in and around the Dallas area um, that we like. So even though Dallas is a very large area, it's obviously one of the larger MSAs, there are still opportunities there based upon simply the amount of available land. Um, you're also not likely to see us, <clears throat> obviously this is outside the smile area, but you're not likely to see us in the Midwest. Um, there are, a few uh, examples uh, of, of areas that we still do like, uh, Minnesota and St. Louis are two um, that I would mention where we think there is some opportunity. Um, but in general, you're not going to see us in the middle. We are focused on the smile. And, and finally, to, to directly address the question, um, we really like the, the metropolitan areas in, in the mid-Atlantic, um, you know, Charleston, Charlotte, Norfolk, um, and outside of those areas, um, we also like the, the Florida Gulf Coast very much, uh, Fort Myers area. Um, we like, uh, uh, when we get further west, uh, Denver, Austin uh, areas as well, and then up into the northwest, uh, the areas uh, around Portland um, and Seattle. So, which is again, a bigger city, but has some outlying areas um, that are compelling. So that's just to give, I know people really like to get a grasp on, uh, on location. So before we signed off, I just want to do that. Um, thank, I want to say thank you to everybody who's attended. Uh, I apologize for running a little bit long and for not getting to quite so many questions as I'd hoped, um, but I will get to everything um, on, the, uh, on the chat or uh, in the Q&A um, and, uh, and make sure I get those answered. Again, thank you very much for attending and I look forward to uh, getting the opportunity to speak to everybody, um, hopefully in one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one and you know, uh, a more direct conversation and I answer even more questions. Thank you very much. Jeremy.